So the next thing I want to talk about regarding input in Nuke is every image sequence or movie or file that you bring into Nuke has its own time base. So that could be time code based and or image based or frame based. Um, and this is where Nuke is really a lot different than a nonlinear editor or a layered based application. So if you actually click into these, and we'll, what we'll do first is go over the property bin for a standard read node and sort of what some of those options are and how they work. And then we'll look at time and how you manipulate it and view it in Nuke. So say we have this MP4 here. And MOVs by default, or movie files by default, their frame range starts at one. Um, if you're dealing with image sequences, an image sequence will start wherever its image is set to start. So in this case, you can see we have a hashed out value and our frame is actually starting at 59815. So if you look at our frame range, that's represented here. But we'll look at our MP4 first. So there are a few options here. You can actually change some of your localization options directly. Format, you can set it here. This is useful if you're dealing with something that's anamorphic or has a non-standard pixel aspect. Usually a pixel's a pixel, but this will allow you to actually change that aspect ratio. Proxy format, if you're using a proxy, you can link it here and you can set its proxy. Frame range, so this is the working range of the file. And when you import something directly, it uses the entire length of that file as the frame range. Say you only wanna work a subset, you could actually modify this as long as you're inside the extents of the frame range. So say we wanted to actually just use from frame 10 to 100, we can modify that directly. One of the nice things is they have an original range, so you can actually see what your original range is if you ever need to revert back or change it. Next up, so in addition to frame range, you do have some either out of range or error, or you have out of range options. So the default is hold, so that if you get out of range, so say this starts at one, or say we, you know, we finish at 636, and if for some reason our project actually goes beyond that, you can change this behavior to either loop the clip, bounce the clip, or go to black. This is a really useful thing if you're working with a lot of different assets where the frame ranges might not align or you might run short on some assets, um, either from a error catching standpoint or from a actual usage standpoint. You know, there are times where I'm using a clip and I want it to actually just hold frame throughout the shot once it's done whatever animation it's done. So that's what these options are here. They change the out of range behavior of that clip. We'll set those back to hold. Next up is the frame option. What this does is it's a way to tell Nuke to start the clip at a different point or to apply some kind of math to that clip. So start at is exactly what it sounds like. So you would enter start at and then a frame number. So a lot of times you'll want your project to start not at one because if, it, if your input actually gets more uh, more frames at the head then you're into negative numbers and that becomes problematic from a rendering standpoint and a file management standpoint So a lot of times you start you start projects at you know frame 100 or a thousand So this allows you to start the clip at a specific frame So this is basically mapping frame one of that clip to frame 100 in your project Offset similar thing offset just goes the other way is a good way to think about it. So if you set start at, it moves the clip 100 you know, further in time. If you use offset, it's moving it 100 earlier in time. So offset's really good if you brought something in and you've done some work and you've just discovered that you need to move it one frame or a few frames, um, or you're trying to do some alignment, you can use offset for that. Another one, and I'm not gonna get deep into this, but expression. Expression allows you to do some more mathematic functions to the frame numbers. So say you want something to play every other frame or skip, you know, skip every frame, play double speed, or do some other more interesting things. You can actually type in expressions using frame as a variable. 
and it will do some do some interesting stuff. So next up, we talked about original range. That's the original range of the clip. You have error handling. Say you're missing a frame in the middle of your image sequence, you can set it to throw an error or you can actually set it to do the nearest frame checkerboard or black. Sometimes if you're, you know, especially if you're dealing with assets that are buried somewhere in your background, you might just set it to nearest frame and no one will ever know that there was a frame missing. Other times you very much want to throw an error so that renders stop and everything else, you know, it becomes apparent that there's a frame issue. Um, you can also use checkerboard and black to kind of do that same thing, not throw an error, but give you a visual indication that there's something missing. Color space, this is an important one. We'll gloss, we'll go over that in another chapter. Um, this allows you to set the proper, basically look up for that clip so that it linearizes properly inside Nuke. You also have a couple options relative to that. Uh, we'll talk about auto alpha. Nuke is very explicit in terms of how it handles channels. So if you have an image like a JPEG that only supports R, G, and B, most applications outside of Nuke will assume an alpha is solid there. Nuke is very explicit in the way it handles it because the JPEG doesn't technically have an alpha. It won't, and you can see here in the channels, it's only showing RGB. And if we toggle into our alpha, you'll see that it's actually black. So if you tick this auto alpha box, it will now add an alpha channel and you'll see that our alpha is white when we toggle over into our alpha. Uh, this becomes really important when we get into merging, which we'll cover here shortly. You can also input as raw data and pre-multiplied if you have an alpha with the clip already, which changes how the edge, the semi-transparent areas are handled. There's some specific movie options. You know, same with EXR, you have specific codec options if those are available. You can see like on our JPEG, we don't have any extra options. So those are the basics of the properties of a read node. So now let's talk a little bit more about time. So when you're viewing something, in the viewer you have a couple options to show you time. You can also, you can toggle between frame and time code. So in this case we're reading you know, from zero. In this case, you can see our start time actually has a, a true time code reading, you know. Uh, so that's that's something to be aware of there is you can operate those. Usually you wanna work in frames. Um, that's typically the easier way. And when we're doing screen burn-ins and stuff like that, we include frame counters. So it's a little easier to digest because we are dealing with clips that have really long time code name, you know, time code values. The next up really kind of important one to, to know is in the viewer, you have an option of what to, for it to automatically scale to what you're viewing. So if you set it to global, global is what your frame range is set in your project settings. If you set it to input, input is whatever your clip happens to be. So in this case, you know, our clip is one to 636. If we look at our EXR sequence, it's 59815 to 59990. And you can see how our, our uh, timeline here automatically updated. So that's really important if you're working with clips, or you're trying to figure out where they are, or you just wanna play them back. You can change this to input, and that will allow you to see the input scale automatically instead of having in just like everything in nuke you can zoom and pan and your timeline just like you can in node graph uh, we have in and out so you can also use the i and o hotkeys to set in and out points and this will automatically scale to in and out if we go back to global you'll see here or you can go to input you can see that it will add those where we put them and you can use these buttons as well to set those. There's also a nice little toggle over here that will turn in and out off. So if you're just working a very specific part of your frame or part of your comp, you can set an in and out. And then when you wanna see it in context of the whole thing, you can turn in and out off without having to manually clear them or move them out. Uh, visible, same thing. It's just showing you what your visible, visible time is. So that's how that works in the viewer. Uh, something else is these are all your channel managements. 
usually you want to stay in RGB. The manual goes over this in pretty good detail, and I'm not going to get too deep into this. This will be more of a color space conversation as well. And something else in terms of a hotkey and usability standpoint, F and H allow you to center to the nearest pixel round off or H is fit. So this will give you a, you know, a random number. Uh, F will round to the nearest value here. 